Next up, we have Peter Harrell. I was actually watching Victor's uh, presentation yesterday. I think uh, Panoramic's in great hands. He's doing a fantastic job in the team they've got there. And that's probably the second most undervalued nickel stock on the market at the moment. Poseidon is the number one undervalued nickel stock. Um, and I own shares in both, so full disclosure. Um, the uh, Poseidon story is, a, is an interesting one. It's a lot of assets that have been around for a long time. But the great thing about them is, is that they're pretty much ready to go. Um, two um, or three underground mines, uh, fully developed, um, both um, and, and could be restarted relatively easily. Um, two processing plants, the replacement cost today of the, you know, with a, with a combined processing uh, capacity of nearly 4 million tonnes. To get something like that permitted and built at either of those sites would be, you know, I'd hate to think how long it would take and what it would cost now, but you wouldn't get much change out of, you know, 200 to 300 million dollars at each site. Um, uh, and to get it permitted and get tailing stamps approved and find actually someone to answer the phone at the various departments um, would be uh, would be a challenge. So I think, you know, we're just so lucky that we've got this walk up restart. Um, we've got a gold tailings project that we're looking for a partner for at the moment. Um, Argonaut PCF are helping us with that. We've got a shortlisted group of people that are doing some further due diligence. Uh, we've had some high grade discoveries. We're still drilling for more high grade and we're looking to be in production at Black Swan sort of middle of next year. Um, in terms of our share price performance, I mean, obviously, if you look at that graph, um, the blue is our share price and the grey is the, uh, the, the nickel price. We've obviously had this amazing run up uh, off the back of this strange situation with uh, Chan Chan and the uh, the, the hedge position that became sort of uh, difficult to manage for him or uh, well for them. Um, but notwithstanding that, we all know that the nickel outlook is very positive. Um, unfortunately, we've got two major shareholders who've been very supportive early on, but have since decided to deploy their capital elsewhere. Uh, and Black Mountain, uh, who came in a few years ago, uh, have, have sold about a third of their position on the market. Um, and Wailu, which is the Andrew Forrest Group, has sold about three quarters of their position. So that's probably been the major reason why the share price hasn't responded to the rise in the nickel price. There's just been this overhead selling. And whenever a major uh, shareholder sells, there's always a bit of a concern about, well, have they finished selling? Are they gonna sell any more or whatever? So look, at the end of the day, Black Mountain are there now. They've still got 12%. Um, Wailu is down, you can see there, to 3.1, and they were selling shares yesterday. So look, I assume that at some point in time in the not-too-distant future, Wailu will be out completely, and hopefully that removes the, the overhang that's sort of in the stock at the moment, and you'll see the, the share price uh, start to respond to the, the positive news flow coming out. Um, look, as I said, it's, it's, you know, capital moves around and um, Andrew Forrest has been in the company since about 07. He was the chairman at one stage and uh, there's plenty of liquidity now in the stock. Uh, when I joined the company, the share price was three cents. Uh, there's been, we've, we've raised another nearly $40 million of new equity. Uh, neither of uh, uh, Wailu or Black Mountain participated in any of those raisings. So you can sort of see the writing was on the wall. They've been out, you know, investing in other things, which is absolutely fine. And I think it's, it's probably a good time for them if they are going to, to move out, to, to move on, and, and we'll get new shareholders in to, to take up that, those positions. So that's fine. We, we talk to them regularly. And, uh, but, you know, there's been a fair bit of sort of chatter on the, the various uh, uh, airwaves about that. And as I said, I don't think there's anything sinister in that. I think, you know, if, if people have been holding shares for a long time and they want to make a profit, then it's good if the market's there for them to, to sell out. Uh, corporate strategy, look, we're all about getting back into production again. Uh, we're targeting sort of 15,000 tonnes of production, which would be, uh, and because we haven't put any feasibility studies out yet, uh, this is all based on previous production. But, you know, if you're sort of talking about having uh, Black Swan going at about 1.1 million tonnes to start off with, which is what we've been talking about with the studies that we're doing. And then Lake Johnson um, at about a million tonnes of underground, you'd be sort of talking about producing somewhere close to 15,000 tonnes of contained nickel and concentrate. Um, you know, and obviously you could move that up if you had more material to put into either of those plants. So, you know, when I was running Panoramic, we got up to a, a production of 20,000 tonnes at a nickel price of about $10. The market cap was sort of over a billion dollars. So I can quite easily see Poseidon moving from a market cap of 250 to a market cap of north of a billion in the current nickel price environment, assuming we get both of those projects off the ground. And so that's the primary focus. 
and uh, and that's what we're spending a lot of time and effort on at the moment. And we've got a, a really great executive team. It's, it's pretty much a new team since I've been there. So Brendan joined just before me, CFO, young, incredibly enthusiastic. I got an email from him at midnight last night on some changes to my presentation. He's incredibly diligent. And he's been doing a great job on the drilling. Uh, we, we got Craig Jones to join us a couple of, uh, just about a month ago. Craig's just recently been at Bellevue and he worked for me at Panoramic on uh, the restart a couple of years ago. Um, really delighted to have Craig on board. Dave Maxton is is just the most diligent metallurgist I've ever met and uh, he dot, dots the I's and crosses the T's about 10 times. Um, and he's doing a fantastic job. He joined just before I did. And then Anthony, who's a Kalgoorlie-based guy, sort of basically runs the site for us. So we've got a great team of people. That's the sort of executive team. It's a very flat structure. And then we've got some fantastic younger people working for us in the office. There's about 10 of us in the office in Perth uh, and a couple of people at site. So a very, very small, dedicated team. And then we use consultants where, where we can. You know, we've all talked about um, the, the, what nickel's doing. Uh, this is a battery uh, conference, and obviously the thematic is that nickel, for the ever since I've been involved in nickel, which is 30 years, um, it was always about the stainless steel demand. And stainless steel was sort of invented almost to consume nickel uh, in the 1950s, and uh, it grew at a compound rate of about 5% per annum and continues to do so. And it's been a fantastic commodity. I mean, if you're going to build anything that wants to last for a long time, you've got to build it out of stainless right and it's always been uh, a, a strong market uh, it's growing it's still at five percent compound but obviously um, there's been a change with the nickel pig iron uh, mostly out of Indonesia and places that really sort of filled up the the shortage and basically stainless steel mills don't want class one nickel they actually want the ferro nickel or the nickel pig iron because they get the iron units cheaper and they've now vertically integrated a lot of these plants in Indonesia so Chan Chan mine their own nickel process making pig iron and actually produce stainless steel in Indonesia so that's kind of a bit of a different story but obviously a few years ago along comes the electric electric vehicle story. And now that whole wave of activity is just really refocusing on, on the, the nickel demand. And you can see there that, and these are some numbers from Glencore, that so that last year or the year before, production of nickel, you know, two and a half million tonnes of primary nickel uh, going predominantly into stainless steel. So 70% of that, so two million tonnes going to stainless. But look at the demand increase. By 2050, they're talking about a four times increase or 3.7 times. I don't know where all that nickel is going to come from. Um, and what's going to obviously have to happen is the nickel price is going to have to stay higher to in, ensure that there's an incentive price to get all of these lower grade projects off the ground. And uh, the amount of capital that's going to have to be invested you know, is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And investors and bankers and the people that finance these projects are not going to put their money into these projects and spend five to ten billion dollars on an HPAL plant that's going to produce uh, mixed hydroxide precipitate to go into a battery plant if they can't see that they're going to get their money back. So they're going to need sort of north of $10, in my view, for, for a long time to come. So I don't think you need to be worried about the fact that, say, a project like ours has been delayed by two months, because I think you're going to be talking about 10 to 20 years of, of high nickel prices. Um, so let's talk about Black Swan. Um, so historically, this project produced uh, nearly 180,000 tonnes of contained nickel, mostly from underground, about 140,000 tonnes from one of the highest grade nickel projects ever discovered in the world, Silver Swan. And I was involved in that project when I was a much younger person in my 20s living in Melbourne. And MPI was the company that discovered that. Um, and uh, we got that project into production in a couple of years, a little 150,000 tonne mill, which is still there. Uh, and then obviously um, it, the project was then um, sold back to Utakumpu, uh, MPI bought it back, and then MPI was taken over by Lion Ore, and then Lion Ore was taken over by Norilsk. Uh, and then Norilsk um, obviously uh, developed the open pit and started mining the low-grade disseminated and the high-grade. And so they took about 40,000 tonnes out of the pit as well before they closed the project when the nickel price was sort of around $5 a pound. Um, we've got quite a, a decent resource here, about 180,000 tonnes of nickel. Most of that is, or sorry, 200,000. Most of that is actually in the low grade disseminated, but there is some high grade material, which is really important. And the focus at the moment is just basically about getting that project restarted, making sure that we've done all the test work so we know exactly what the recoveries are going to be, what the mining rates are going to be. And, uh, and get this project into production. So if you look at this schematic, 
You can see there's the open pit at the top there, which we obviously will hope to extend a lot deeper. You can see down the side of the page there, you've got the original Silverstone Discovery at the top, and then going all the way down there, about 1.5 kilometres below surface, we've got all those uh, ore bodies that we've been working on just recently. We've just been drilling out Tundra Mute, finished all of that work. Um, again, because of COVID, people have been sick. Uh, consultants have only just finished the work and we're hoping to release the up, uh, updated resource sometime next week on the Silver Swan or the, the, predominantly the Tundra Mute uh, ore body itself. Uh, we've been drilling uh, from below the open pit from Gosling back up to work out how much uh, serpentinite ore we've got, uh, and that drilling's been finished as well. We're just waiting for all the assays. Again, as everyone knows, assays used to take two weeks, now they take two months and all these things are just delaying things. And as I said, I'm not too worried about it because I think that it's not like the nickel price is just gonna spike and it's already $15, so let's say it stays at $10. You know, it's not gonna drop, drop back to $5. Otherwise, where's the nickel gonna come from for all these motor cars that we're gonna be producing? Uh, this is a slide that I love showing. David Burt in the middle was our old um, exploration manager at, uh, at Silver Swan. That's the discovery hole. Uh, and we drilled that hole, um, and it was about 200 metres below surface, following up an old Western mining hole that had been drilled in the 70s, or Anglo-American uh, Anglo hole, I think. And uh, we discovered 440,000 tonnes of 14% nickel drilled it out in about six months. And I just did some sums today. If you put spot price in today and you assume an 80% um, or what did I say there, 85% 80, um, resource reserve conversion, which is pretty reasonable for an ore body that's 14% in situ, you apply 92% metallurgical recovery. I've probably been conservative there an 80% smelter payability, which we know is roughly what the, the smelters are paying for concentrate at the moment, and you put spot prices in, the, the, the value of that material today shipped to a smelter is nearly $1.7 billion. Obviously, you've got to take the operating costs off that, but you can see the margins in a, a little ore body that's, you know, a sort of uh, 400 metres uh, depth and uh, 50 or 60 metres wide. It's incredible. So the value add from exploration, and that's why so many nickel companies have floated and that's what everyone's chasing another silver swan and they've got to be out there so uh, we're, we're looking for one of those and we thought we might have had one at golden swan last year uh, and we did have an ore body unfortunately it wasn't quite as big as that but we're, there are sniffs everywhere around here and we'll be looking intently for the next couple of years there's a huge opportunity to increase the the, the scope of this project at the moment we're working on a smaller pit but we think there's the potential to have a much, much bigger pit. You can see the pit would almost go down to the gosling there. So this is one of the um, um, the pit optimizations that have been done for us. And all of this work is going on at the moment and we're just really excited about this stuff is all coming together over the next couple of months. Um, so what we've got is the potential to feed basically open pit material, and let's call it at about a million tonne a year. Silver Swan high grade underground, which is gonna run sort of between five and 10% in, in situ, or sorry, mined head grade. Golden Swan eventually will come in as well. There's about 6,000 tonnes there. And then Silver Swan tailings. And the reason we're blending in the old Silver Swan tailings is to get the iron MGO ratio to the point where the material is saleable. Um, you need the iron MGO ratio to be sort of about three to one. Any, any, any less than that, then it starts to cause problems for the smelter. So we can blend our material using that, that the tailings to actually get the iron MGO ratio into the right sort of level. So we've been out to the market with the typical specification that we hope to produce and we've been knocked over in the rush by traders and smelter companies who want to buy this material. So we're, we're absolutely certain that the material is, is marketable and the payabilities are, are certainly in that sort of 75 to 80%. Uh, this is the revised timetable we put out a couple of days ago. Everything is going along, it's just that there's delays in the market from, from COVID and just the, the, the pressures on consultants and laboratories and, and a little bit of extra drilling that we did. And it's pushed the project out a couple of months. You know, so what? <laughs> it's, uh, we're talking about a project that's gonna be many, many years. So a couple of months. And in fact, from my perspective, I actually think it doesn't hurt to push the project out a touch just because of just how much pressure there is in the, in the pricing. So it doesn't bother me that this thing is slipping just a few months. And that's all based on just the, the, the tightness of the market. 
So that's Black Swan. Lake Johnson is another really wonderful opportunity for us. Another uh, lion ore project uh, was built in the 80s. Uh, this is a photograph of the mill, uh, one and a half million tonnes, incredibly you know, well-constructed operation. Uh, and ran for many years, uh, produced about 100,000 tonnes of contained nickel, uh, initially out of Emily Ann, which was a 3.5% uh, in situ ore body, and then they moved over to Maggie Hayes, sub-level cave, it was running about 1.5% nickel, produces a very clean sort of 14% concentrate, very saleable product, no, no issues with that. There's still about 50,000 tonnes of nickel at 1.5% in Maggie Hayes. The mine's flooded, so we'd have to pump it out, re-establish all, all, all the infrastructure, probably take... 18 months to do that, but but very doable. And the processing plant is in is in very good condition. Uh, we had GRs have a quick look at that uh, late last year, and they said, look, Peter, $30 million to refurb that six or seven months and an OPEX of $36 a tonne. Um, you know, very, very competitive in this market. Again, to, to build a new one of these, there's, there's a 200 person camp, there's an airstrip. I mean, talk about, you know, walk up it's so easy. Um, and, you know, you're saving yourself four years, uh, assuming you can get all the permitting done. Uh, and, you know, two, three hundred billion dollars of capital. So we're, we're so lucky there. So but like Black Swan, you know, 10 percent of the cost of the plant to, to refurb versus versus a new plant. So what we're going to do is update that mining study that was done by previous management some years ago, look at the cost of the, of the dewatering and the refurb and put another feasibility study together, probably in the second half of this year, once we've finished the, the Black Swan study. We're also just about to start exploration up here. We did. We had New Exco, who do a lot of our work for us, do a review of all of the data, and uh, what we're obviously looking for is more Maggie Hayes and even better, some more Emily Ann material. And previous management, Steve Warren, when he was exploration manager, did discover Abbey Rose, named it after his wife, um, and we need to obviously go and follow that up again. But what we have identified, which is this uh, slide here, is the uh, aeromagnetics on this, what they call the Western Ultramafic. So Andy and the team have designed up a 15,000 um, metre RC program and we're delighted to um, have just been advised that we've got the POW approved for that. So we've got a drilling contractor uh, and we're just finalising all of that and we hope to be on the ground very soon. So uh, that's that's really exciting. So we're, 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 we're hopeful we'll be on the ground during the June quarter and doing that drill program. And if we can find some more Emily Ann material, that, that's going to be phenomenal. But, you know, there is an ore body there already that, that could be restarted. So. Uh, we're in a fantastic position. And last but by no mean least, the original uh, Poseidon, which is not our company but the previous Poseidon, uh, the shares went from dollar to $270 a share. We still get phone calls occasionally from people that own um, uh, Poseidon NL uh, script and got a call from a guy the other day, some old pensioner in Adelaide, said, I've got some of your shares. I bought them in 1970. And I said, oh, I'm not sure that they're our shares, but he sent me through a copy of it. It was one of the old original scripts. Uh, unfortunately, the, the previous um, Poseidon uh, doesn't exist anymore. So what happened was Western Mining actually took over the asset which was Mount Windara, they developed the mine and they ran it for quite a few years until about 84. Um, and they mined about 8 million tonnes of ore and produced about 84,000 tonnes of nickel. It was quite an uh, important producer for them at a much lower nickel price environment. Uh, there's already still about 170, 140,000 tonnes of nickel underground, averaging about 1.5 or 1.6 in Mount Windara ore body and also in the Cerberus ore body, which was, again was discovered by the, the new Poseidon, uh, our company. There's also a gold tailings project, which in includes the Lancefield uh, tailings as well, about 180,000. Dave did a great study on this and we've been, as I said, working with uh, Argonaut to secure a partner for this project. But again, our focus is on the, um, in, is on the nickel here. Uh, we did also get the Windara State Agreement terminated, which was a, a, a journey. I think it's taken about five years. Um, and that allows us obviously to process the gold as well, because previously it was a nickel only uh, type arrangement, but now the gold can be, can be can be dealt with, which is good as well. But the plan here is to actually look at, can we, because there's no processing plant here anymore, can we mine from underground at Windara and or Cerberus, bring ore to the surface and truck it down to Black Swan? And that would make a lot of sense because we've got two and a half or 2.2 million tonnes of milling capacity at Black Swan. At this stage, we're only talking about using 1.1. As I said before, most of the material that will come will be from the open pit at 
0.7 uh, resource grade. So if you can bring material down at one and a half percent nickel, then obviously that's a that's a huge bonus. And and 300 kilometres sounds like a long way, but at 20 cents a tonne kilometre, versus not having to build a, build a new mill, you know you can you can truck a lot of dirt for that difference. So that's exciting. So look, it's it's all about filling the mills, um, but firstly we start off with the 1.1 million tonne derated case at Black Swan. Um, we've got the disseminated material. We know there's a lot more of that material. We're, we're, we've been drilling and we're finding plenty more of that material. Previous owners had some very, very big numbers in, in some of their uh, inventories and we hope that we can sort of put some of those numbers out into the marketplace once we've verified them all. Um, there's other feeds, as I mentioned, so we could bring um, Windara down to Black Swan after we get Black Swan started again. There's other stranded assets in the region and once we restart the Black Swan concentrator, you know, those ore bodies become available, if you like, from whether it's a joint venture or an outright purchase or an ore tolling arrangement. And we obviously want to keep exploring. I just mentioned we've got a, a big program about to start at, at Lake Johnson. Uh, we've also got something that's pretty exciting too, this partnership with Pure Battery Metals, which we announced a couple of weeks ago. So we're delighted that our partner, Pure Battery, uh, together with us, got a one, nearly $120 million grant from the MMI, from the federal government. Uh, and this is for the refinery that uh, uh, Pure Battery Metals are planning in to build in Kalgoorlie. Now, it, it, we, we think this will happen for sure, and certainly $120 million from the government, which is about a, a fifth of the cost of that plant, goes a long way. Um, that, that plant would be a POX front end uh, producing a mixed hydroxide precipitate and then obviously a PCAM back end, and that's producing obviously a, a battery product, which is, is clearly makes a lot of sense. At the moment, if we should concentrate say overseas to Jingxuan or to Belieden in, in Harry Valter, we have to ship it to Esperance as concentrate, put it on a ship, and ship it to, to Jingxuan at you know, 10 to 12% concentrate. So 90% of that material is waste and we pay for the shipping cost of that, you know, and all up from down from Black Swan to Kalgoorlie, down to Esperance and on a ship, it's probably today $200 a tonne. Now, if you're shipping just that concentrate down to Cambalda and producing a, a value add product, then you're saving all of that freight Plus, you're getting better, hopefully better payability because you know you're, you're avoiding a much more sort of convoluted um, smelting and refining step going straight through. So, we're absolutely delighted that um, that our partner uh, together with us got this, and we're working really hard together. And we've got a big meeting today with these guys to start working out. We've got an MOU. We obviously need to have a definitive agreement of how the relationship is going to go forward. So, certainly this is a this is a game changer for for our our projects in in in. In, in the future. Uh, so the key deliverables for, for us this year are around getting all of the resources we have converted to a mining inventory and then to a reserve as part of the feasibility study. Uh, we want to continue to explore for the high grade material and certainly we want to, we want to go back and have another look on this, the Golden Swan or the what we call the Southern Terrace. We must complete the feasibility study and as I said we have drifted a couple of months but not through mostly through things outside of our control but in terms of where the nickel price is going that, that, that doesn't worry me at all and it shouldn't worry shareholders that we've, we've lost a couple of months there or, or delayed it. As we haven't delayed Later. It's just taking a bit longer. Um, we want to also have a look at whether it makes sense to ship a bit of DSO, direct shipping ore from Silver Swan first. So we'll, we'll run those numbers now that we've just about finished that resource uh, work. We can then convert that to an inventory and get the, the, the idea would be to basically finance or put the feasibility study out and announce the financing at the same time and the fact that we're going. So do it all together. So that's our plan. So around September, so be, be mindful that that's something that's going to be happening then. Windara, we've had the state agreement terminated, which has been a long and involved process, so that's good. We want to do this trucking study, uh, trucking the ore down to, to, to Black Swan or Leinster if BHP want to buy it off us. It's about the same distance. Um, and then obviously finalise that deal on the tailings, which is underway get the drilling at Lake Johnson started and hopefully find some more ore down there. Uh, and then obviously finalise the agreement with, with pure battery, which is which is primary. So look, the last thing I wanted to say is my old man was a boot maker. A lot of people know that that's a, that's a photograph of him. Sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, that's a photograph of him in Harold's shoes, which my great grandfather built that factory in 1928. So I was the fourth generation and I didn't go into the shoe business. And my old man said to me one day in 1978, I think he said, Pete, you better go to university and study something because making shoes is a bit hard in Australia. Funnily enough, they still make shoes uh, 
Harold Shoes do, but they're now made in Vietnam, obviously lower cost there. But I remember Dad saying to me one day, he said, you know, I took him up to Land Frankie when we were running that, and I took him down, we drove all the way down to the bottom, and uh, he said, shit, he said, you know, we've, we've been in the car for an hour and a half, we've driven, I don't know how many kilometres, nine or 10 kilometres, got down to the bottom, there's no one down here, there's one truck. How do you make any money out of this? And I said, well, Dad, see that truck going up the decline? That's got $200,000 worth of nickel, and he goes, Oh, he said, that's easy in making shoes. So uh, I always remember that, and, and I reckon now that truck would be worth a lot more than 200,000 bucks. You know? So uh, uh, if Dad was around today, I'd love to take him back down to the bottom of Silver Swan and show him how we can make some serious money out of this ore body. Thanks very much.